Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Roberto Horowitz, and I'm the chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And uh, I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to make a brief announcement uh, in regards to the College of Engineering. It's going to be uh, very soon uh, launching an aerospace engineering undergraduate major. And uh, the expected uh, launch is in fall 2022, that is uh, one year for next fall. And uh, the, the degree, uh, the undergraduate aerospace uh, engineering degree will be hosted by the mechanical engineering department initially. We estimate that there will be about uh, 40 incoming fresh students. And we expect a total enrollment between 200 to 250 students within four years, and that would include uh, junior transfer. We're also expecting uh, double majors and transfer from other majors within the College of Engineering. Um, for those of you who are uh, already students in uh, Berkeley and are inter interested in aerospace engineering, uh, we like to also remind you that uh, we have an aerospace engineering minor which was recently uh, launched and is sponsored by the Mechanical Engineering Department. And it consists of three courses, uh, which are listed there, uh, engineering aerodynamics, control of unmanned aerial vehicles, and composite materials. And there are more courses to come. And uh, these courses can also be used for an aerospace master of engineering track at uh, Berkeley. So I'm just briefly going to show you the, um, the curriculum. And I uh, just want to point out that we are already working quite uh, hard in setting up the aerospace seminar, the aero design and aero lab and capstan projects. So with that, I'm going to stop now. And uh, I'm going to now introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Panos Papadopoulos, who has been a strong advocate for uh, this program at Berkeley. And without further ado, Panos, please uh, go ahead. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much, Roberto. I would like to welcome our students, our staff and faculty to uh, today's um, webinar. Uh, we have a wonderful program. It's a great pleasure to introduce our guests for today's panel. Howard McKenzie and Navid Hussein are two extraordinarily accomplished engineers and industry leaders at Boeing. We look forward to hearing their views on future challenges in commercial aviation and aerospace engineering. So our program will feature a presentation by Navid on Boeing's uh, research priorities and, and visions, vision. And this will be followed by a Q&A session with Howard and Navid. Uh, and our audience is most welcome to um, uh, ask questions, submit questions for the panelists. And you can do that uh, by clicking the uh, little Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and we will do our best to uh, pose as many of the uh, questions that you have uh, to our panelists. We do, by the way, have a hard stop at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, before we continue, I just want to, uh, to note that um, we will, our guests will not be able to entertain any questions uh, related to the 737 MAX. We appreciate the sensitivity of this topic. And there is an official Boeing document on this, and we'll, we'll be happy to provide a link to this document. It's going to appear on your uh, chat box uh, shortly. Uh, today, we'll just concentrate on the, on the bright, exciting future of um, aerospace engineering. So let me take a moment to introduce Howard. Howard McKenzie is, a, is the vice president and chief engineer for Boeing's uh, Global Services Unit. Uh, this is the unit that's in charge of providing service solutions to the whole range of um, Boeing's customers from commercial aviation, military, and space. Howard is a Berkeley mechanical engineer, class of 1988. He is the Boeing lead for the Berkeley campus, and we're very appreciative for that. And in my view, most importantly, he is a genuine friend and a strong supporter of Berkeley engineering. So Howard, welcome back to Berkeley even if it is a virtual return and the floor is yours. Thank you, Panos, and uh, welcome to um, all that have joined us today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I wish we could be on campus. Uh, it's been a year since I have been on campus, right as the shutdown was occurring, and we, we still were able to meet with several of the, the student groups and faculty that, that we intended to meet with. 
And um, as Pano said, we are, we are partners at Cal and uh, look forward to all of our engagements um, as we go forward. Um, I'm really excited today because I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, someone I have uh, tremendous respect for. And uh, sometimes I sit in awe of uh, Dr. Naveed Hussain, who is uh, our chief technology um, officer for Boeing. Um, and also the Vice President and General Manager of Boeing Research and Technology. And uh, Ravid has graciously uh, um, agreed to, to come today and share perspectives on the future challenges in uh, commercial aviation and aerospace engineering. And Navid is a uh, Stanford um, graduate and wow, that's all right. We, we honor Navid anyway. So thank you, Navid. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Cal, and um, I know you have a tremendous uh, uh, presentation to share, so I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Howard, and uh, Professor Horowitz, Professor Papadopoulos, the entire uh, department. Berkeley, I just want to thank you for, for having Boeing here today. Uh, I get to join um, my, my great colleague, Howard, uh, and, uh, and be with you all, so it's a great honor for us. And, uh, and we appreciate it. You know, as, as, uh, as Howard mentioned, you know, that there's wonderful opportunity that we see ahead in, in our field. And um, I, don't, I don't know if my, um, my charts are being shared or not. I, I'm not able to view them on my screen. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. Um, but we've also been through, uh, as, and I don't need to tell this to anybody, certainly on this call, uh, really unprecedented challenges uh, in the last few years, um, driven by a worldwide pandemic, you know, and, and it has perhaps been the most sort of stunning fiscal upset our industry has ever seen. Uh, so we have, uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, in, in the process, we have, um, we still are, you know, being tested in, in many ways. And so uh, uh, we, we are, just, you know, rise to this challenge and create a great future together. So if I may, I'll, I'll go to the next chart. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, here you see uh, traffic traffic international as well as domestic and the dotted line is, is total. And you can see the, the strong drop in, in the international uh, traffic uh, due to COVID. Uh, now, we project that um, things will recover. You know, the, the one thing that we have found through many different challenges, uh, certainly the tragic events of 9-11, uh, SARS, other other kinds of uh, um, impacts. The the one thing we have learned is is the the resilience of of I'll say just the human spirit. You know, uh, people's desire to connect with, with family and conduct business um, all across the globe, and we don't see this as any different. Uh, now, the, of course, the timing is something that we're, we're keeping a very close eye on. And what we're seeing already and what we project is that it will really be paced by the uptake of these vaccines. And it, and it, it really is, you know, certainly not in my field, but I stand in awe of these brilliant scientists that have developed these vaccines. You know, in, a, in an unprecedented time scale with extraordinary efficacy uh, and using, of course, science um, uh, underpinning all of it. So it's just a really uh, amazing uh, achievement uh, for humanity, you know, and, um, and it's a, that is what's going to pace us kind of getting back to a world that looks closer to what we know as normal. And we kind of see that traffic uh, coming back into 2023, 2024 timeframe with, with international lagging uh, the domestic uh, uh, 
effects. And, and so um, this chart really kind of says it all, you know, in, in many ways, it sums up uh, certainly the year that Howard and I have had, and um, probably many of you uh, in many different ways. Uh, and and it's, it's been very sad, you know, the, 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 the human effect, the family effects, um, but, but we have to also keep our eye on, on how we all come back. And so uh, I just wanted to share that. Um, next chart. So what, you know, what is, is changing aerospace? And, and there's just so much. And, and what we, we see is that, and this is not just the case for aerospace, but, but the rate of change is just continuing to accelerate uh, in, in technology. Uh, whether it's um, things around healthy travel and how we we create the most safe cabin environment, uh, no matter what um, things might be uh, present that could affect your health, you know, certainly particles, airborne kind of viruses and such. The digitization of not just how we design uh, and build, but also how we sustain our, our products uh, as they're in our customers' fleets uh, and the digitization that happens across this life cycle. AI and autonomy, you know, sometimes they go together and the importance of categorizing, collecting important data to train these kinds of, of technologies. The environment and sustainability, you know, this is a topic very important for our age uh, and for our futures and, and for our families' futures. Um, electrification, you're seeing this in, in several industries as well, uh, where companies are, are focused and pivoting uh, in certain segments of their products towards a more electric future. Advanced materials and manufacturing never goes out of style in aerospace. And when I think about model-based engineering, digital engineering, uh, the modeling at the microstructure level of a material and things like additive manufacturing. Uh, this is an area that continues to advance and it, is a, it creates game changers for, for, the, for the performance and the durability of our products. Cyber and quantum, uh, certainly areas that we pay close attention to. And then of course, the rapid increased access to space. So a lot of, there's, and, and this is, it's, it's just great to see Berkeley starting an undergraduate program in, in aerospace engineering. And when you think about all of these different technologies from autonomy to material science to embedded software to avionics, uh, to sort of high performance computing. Um, sometimes you have to even ask yourself, what is aerospace engineering, right? Because it, you kind of can make it as rich and as broad as you want to. And, and I think it, it ultimately stems from folks that self-select into this amazing mission, which is around um, connecting people, protecting people, exploring uh, the universe. Um, and, and there's so many different paths uh, that can be taken uh, that it, it, it has been an amazing career uh, because you, you, can, you can learn, first of all, so much. And then sometimes you want diversity in your, in your experiences in your career. And you can get that all within aerospace, uh, a career in aerospace, uh, depending on uh, where, whether you want to kind of go deep in one technology, whether you perhaps want to stay broad, uh, whether you want to get into policy or sales, uh, what, whether you want to get into um, very disruptive kinds of, of innovation. It really, I have to say, I mean, uh, I found it to be very rewarding. It, it kind of has it all. Um, and I'm just, I applaud uh, a, a great university like Berkeley to, to kind of go all in here, you know, on, on this very important area. 
Um, next chart, please. You know, our, our company, Boeing, has developed some priorities when we think about research and development. And, uh, and it's important to write down priorities. You know, we, we of course have a long list of interests uh, be, because of what I mentioned, the diversity of the technologies within our, our industry. But without prioritizing, you know, it's hard to get big things done. And so when we think about the four big rocks, if you will, that we wanna focus on uh, in, the, in the near and medium term and long term for Boeing, it really would be around model-based engineering. And that this is a, a very important space of capability where we think about an engineer at her desk and thinking about how she can understand the decisions that she's making in her piece of the design cycle and how those decisions affect the entire life cycle. And, you know, Will Roper, uh, who used to be an undersecretary in the DOD, said this is sort of truly a godlike power, you know, in the hands of, of our engineers. And, and it is, you know, and we see this as a game changer for, for how we can create a very safe and very high performing products uh, using an interconnected digital environment for engineering, again, across design, development, integration, test, production, and sustainment. Uh, the other priority is around the modular architecture and digital backbone of our products and our services. And, and this sort of gets into command and control to a certain extent. And I know that sounds like a military term, but really when you think about your own cell phone, it, it's a kind of a command and control device. You know, you, you're, you're controlling your schedule. You're, you're even tracking your health. You're uh, managing your finances. Uh, uh, you're booking business and as well as entertainment. Uh, you, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is the kind of command and control and digital connectivity that frankly, we've all become very accustomed to. And it's no different when we think about the interconnectedness of our products, our services, our infrastructure. And then for certainly the military, when we th they think about things like joint all domain command and control. Advanced production system, you know, right now, uh, people like Howard and I, you know, we are spending just as much, maybe even more time on not just which products that we build, but how we build them. And this creates, this is an area that can create extraordinary value uh, for our customers. Uh, certainly they seek performance. They want the very finest products, the most competitive products, but we also have to build them in a way that that does that sort of bakes in that value engineering uh, so that they become accessible and, and they can change you know, the, 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 the dynamics of a marketplace. And then certainly last, but certainly not least uh, is the area of sustainability. And then I lumped that in with future mobility. And we have committed that by 2030, all of our commercial aircraft will be operating with sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, we have joined in with IATA and other organizations around uh, carbon commitments. And um, in the 2050 kind of timeframes. And it also ties importantly into a vision of a more electrified and perhaps a more autonomous uh, form of mobility uh, in the future. And our goal at Boeing is, is not to, to watch these changes, but to lead them. You know, if, if you know, our, our mantra inside our company is that, look, uh, if aerospace is gonna be disrupted, you know, Boeing is gonna be the one to disrupt it. And that's our goal, you know, it's our ambition. You know, I'm not, um, and, uh, and that's what we strive to do every single day. Next chart. 
please. This is just a kind of a snapshot of, of some of the research projects and areas, and it's a, there's a bit of an overlap of some of the things I talked about earlier, but, but now I'll get a little bit more into the specifics. Around autonomy, you know, this is an area where uh, there will be uh, more, certainly that's an MQ-25 in the picture. There's a, there's a cargo air vehicle that we developed uh, as part of our R&D programs. And so we study uh, how to create a very safe uh, operational airspace and form of transport, whether it's for cargo or whether it's for a mission or ultimately uh, perhaps to move um, people uh, using autonomy as an enabling technology. AIML, you know, many times we think about that as, as, as this similar to autonomy, but boy, it, it really is, is so much, it, there's a lot of breadth to that topic. And I'll give you an example. Right now, we're working on a project that uses AI and machine learning in the factory to predictively build shims for our products so that we, we can take out some of the repetitive uh, touch kind of tasks and use machines to visually, you know, um, use, use visualization technologies to map geometries, learn from all of the products that we've done in the past. That's the power of, of AI and ML to, to uh, use those kinds of predictive technologies to create very high quality and integrity in our factories. Quantum computing is another area, advanced microelectronics, many times pacing, things that I've talked about already around autonomy and AI. Composites is a, a huge part of our future and, and certainly our current business. And how can we continue to move that forward in terms of rate? Um, additive manufacturing, and you know, this is where, where the complexity of a part many times can come for free uh, uh, because, because this, this allows you to, uh, uh, to even build complexity in to a part that you can't even see. It's internal to the structure of the part. Uh, air power teaming system, a program in Australia that we sometimes call a loyal wingman, an autonomous wingman uh, that we've now flown. Power and thermal, you know, these, again, these are sort of core technologies that don't ever go out of style. We just want to, there's actually pieces of additive manufacturing that enable us to build very high performing and low weight heat exchangers. Again, because of the complexity in a part like that, that can come at a very attractive cost and rate when we think about additive manufacturing. Hypersonics, uh, certainly our DOD is very interested in this and it, and we, we don't know when, but there's, there's, we always want to make sure we're looking far ahead to the future on how that could become a commercial, commercially viable technology, sustainability and future mobility, I've already mentioned, as well as digital engineering on the how. So these are just a, a quick picture of some of the things that we're working on. Uh, we have not backed off, you know, that there has been some tough decisions we've made in R&D but we spend in the billions uh, in, uh, when we think about research and development at Boeing. That is something we continue to do uh, despite many financial challenges associated with some of the charts I showed earlier around traffic and the impact uh, to the sales of our products and our services. But we, will, we won't take our foot off the gas on innovation and technology because that will pace uh, the future of, of our industry. Next chart, if I could, please. I just wanted to briefly talk about innovation at Boeing broadly. You know, there's not just one part of Boeing that has the lock on innovation. You know, every Boeing employee is an innovator uh, and they don't, they're not, I'm not just talking the engineering groups, you know, uh, our finance team, our HR team, our global sales and marketing, our communications team. We're all innovators at Boeing. We have to be. You know, it, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, you know, the marketplace is a strict disciplinarian. You know, and and uh, you know the status quo uh, is 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 it not a 
sticking with the status quo is never really the greatest business strategy. So we, you know, our team at, at Boeing, uh, we, we think about how do we need to change? How can we innovate to change our company? And there's just so many pieces of it. You think about our business units and Boeing Commercial Airplanes, Boeing Global Services, Boeing Defense. There's arms within those business units like product development and Phantom Works that are focused on those generation after next kind of products. MQ-25 came out of Phantom Works, for instance. Aurora Flight Sciences, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Boeing, is focused on rapid prototyping and demonstrators. SkyGrid, a, a, a joint venture between Boeing and Spark Cognition focused on managing a future airspace that may go from tens of thousands of vehicles to perhaps millions of, of vehicles when you think about unmanned and, and drones. And WISC is, is a company, again, another a joint venture where we are, are very much focused on, on unlocking a future of of advanced and autonomous mobility. Uh, Boeing Analytics, thinking about the power of data and how we can serve our customers with, with the greatest efficiency, safety, and productivity of their fleet. Uh, information technology and data analytics, our, our IT and DA group within Boeing, really enabling and creating an engine and infrastructure to, the way I'll say it is to allow every Boeing engineer to be a data scientist. Uh, Boeing avionics, of a key vertical where we're very focused on, I'll say, understanding, designing, and building, and, and owning the brains, the nervous system of our products. Disruptive computing and networks, I talked about quantum, I talked about cyber and other. Uh, we have to think about the future of uh, processing and, and how we can be a part of, of that change. Horizon X, we've invested with equity in various different startups aligned to our business. And we partner with these small companies uh, as, a, as a company with, again, skin in the game, but also an aligned technology interest. And then of course, our 50-50 joint ownership of HRL in Malibu with General Motors. So this is just kind of a snapshot of all of the different kinds of innovation happening at Boeing. But I will say that every part of Boeing is, is an innovation organization, uh, not just uh, one, not just the R&D piece. Go to the next chart, if I could, please. And then uh, I wanted to just mention a bit on sustainability and, and future mobility. You know, it, sustainability is, is such an important topic. It, it involves certainly our environment. It involves our communities and our, our, our people, our topics such as social justice. And, and this is uh, an area that, that has, has caused much of us great reflection, deep reflection, uh, kind of a look in the mirror uh, as individuals in society. And uh, it is part of our sustainability topics uh, to face into head on. And then of course, uh, governance, you know, and how policy and um, how we can affect great change and be, be a, a very important partner in, in how these policies are set towards a more sustainable future in our industry. And then of course, we think about future mobility. This is, this is centered on safety. You know, we, we bring years and years of, of experience and expertise in creating a safe infrastructure uh, for people uh, to, to, to improve their lives. And that is our headset that underpins all of our focus on a, on a future mobility architecture. Certainly sustainable, it, it looks more electric. You know, it, it, looks, uh, it looks like a future which is uh, uh, less, less impactful uh, to our environment in a number of different ways. So we're very focused on this uh, around sustainability, which is, which is again around our people, our products, our communities, our customers and operators. Uh, and, and then of course uh, on future mobility. So 
both very important topics to, to Boeing. And uh, we even, we recently named a chief sustainability officer on the executive council of our company. And he has been really instrumental in tying together, not just the, the technology piece, but all dimensions of sustainability. So if we keep going, uh, I think that is, um, we can open it up to, uh, oh, just real quick. I, I talked about these a little bit uh, on future mobility. I talked about WISC, which is around that uh, autonomous um, aircraft, the SkyGrid joint venture. We're, we're working uh, jointly with, with NASA on exploring new concepts of, of subsonic transport, including a concept that we've developed called the transonic truss braced wing which takes advantage of, of thin wing, high efficient aerodynamic configurations, um, high bypass ratio, uh, uh, turbofan and, and potentially hybrid electric powertrains, um, advanced flight controls, uh, and, e and even looking potentially at uh, inserting uh, autonomous systems to improve safety. So with that, I believe I will turn it back over uh, and maybe we can have some questions uh, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Navid, for this uh, most compelling uh, presentation. I'm, I'm sure many of the items that you touched upon will, will uh, come back in our uh, question and answer session. So I, I do, again, encourage our audience to uh, um, start posing questions in the Q&A uh, part of their Zoom session. But um, while this is happening, let me take a chance, that the opportunity to pose the first question, which is about sustainability. You mentioned it pretty prominently. Commercial aviation is a source of greenhouse gas emissions. We all understand that. And, and we do see this growing sensitivity, sort of a sense of guilt about the carbon footprint of air travel, be it business travel or, or leisure travel. We're seeing unprecedented things, major airports scrapping plans for expansion due to climate change concerns. We see at the same time, major carriers uh, committing to fully decarbonizing, decarbonized commercial transport by 2050, startups that are promising low emission, hybrid fuel, transcontinental flights in the next few years. What is Boeing's research strategy on, on sustainable commercial aviation? And to be a little bit more specific, what are, in your view, the principal technical challenges that need to be overcome to achieve such ambitious goals? Yeah, this is a very, this is a very good question. And um, there are a number of different tenants that underpin our strategy towards sustainability. And I would say, uh, in order of impact, uh, Professor Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos uh, first and foremost, it's around unlocking the, the, the capability of our products to operate on sustainable aviation fuels. And, and we have made a commitment that by 2030, all of our commercial aircraft developed will operate on these kinds of fuels. Uh, and, and there's, there's technology that, that under, whether it's seals or whether it's how we can incorporate these kinds of fuels, many of, of which are, are actually more efficient uh, you know, than, than their, um, their, their counterparts. Uh, that, that is a, a huge foundational piece to this journey. Uh, the other part, the other parts are a little more varied and have different timescales. Uh, we, of course, are looking at alternate powertrains, uh, things like hybrid electric powertrains, uh, even looking longer term on the prospect of, of hydrogen. You know, we, we have our eye on, on these very closely. We don't, we don't ignore this at all. Um, there are realities to, to affect change. We have to have realistic roadmaps to insert these technologies in time scales that make a difference, you know, in, in the near and midterm. Uh, and we see tho those prioritizing aviation fuels and hybrid electric as the highest. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to a question from our, our audience. Uh, we, we have a formal, former F-18 pilot in our, in our group here, yeah. which uh, is wonderful. I welcome him. Um, I would like to ask on his behalf or her behalf, um, the question about the future of, of military aviation, fighter aviation. Um, there are upgrades to the F-18 and then of course there's the F-35. The question is, is the F-35 the last manned fighter or is there room in the future for more advanced manned fighter planes? Are we moving quickly to the unmanned fighters in the arena of uh, the military? This is a great question, you know, and um, I don't know if I can answer it, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, because uh, some of those uh, officials in the DOD would provide, I think, the, the, the more informed uh, answer, but we have some thoughts on this. Uh, we see a future of tactical military aircraft as being more autonomous. And what I mean by that is that there could be a human in the loop, or it could be a human sort of on the loop. Uh, and we also think about human machine interactions uh, being changed with, with autonomy. And when you think about the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, act loop, and, and there's no one better to ask about that than an F-18 pilot, uh, there's no question that a machine's OODA loop uh, is going to be faster. But when we think about technologies like AI and we think about technologies like autonomy, we, we think about how we augment human capability, not a future that sort of replaces it. Um, so the way I would answer the question is that we're introducing technologies and products that have more autonomy, uh, that increase and, and create the, the world's most capable OODA loop processing uh, in a tactical environment, but uh, in a way that augments human judgment. Thank you very much. We, we have another question, which I'm also extremely curious to hear your, your take, and it, it has to do with some on the commercial aviation sector and it has to do with the debate between single aisle and double aisle commercial uh, transport. We've seen obviously in the last few years how the single aisle has been in many ways displacing the, uh, the uh, double aisle or even the double decker airplanes. Um, the Airbus A321XLR has been sort of this example of a plane that can fly the long haul actually with very good economics. Where is Boeing, what is Boeing thinking about sort of the new middle of the market aircraft? Is it gonna be a 767 size, a mid-size twin aisle, or is it gonna be more like a 757 successor, single aisle, very good economics? Where is the, the I know you, this is a big internal discussion. A lot of starts and stops have happened. Where are you right now on this? Yeah. So we are, we are in the midst of, of studying the, these markets and we understand, uh, and it's a very good question, you know, we, it's a very important segment of, of the market, the one you're describing, you know, uh, which is this middle of the market, kind of a, uh, perhaps a, on the higher end of a, of a single aisle uh, capability and perhaps the, the very low end of a, of, a, of a twin aisle capability. And the way we go about studying these is, is with, with our customers in mind. You know, when we think about a new product at Boeing, what we don't fall in love with per se is a particular configuration. You know, we, we don't latch on to a solution. What we latch on to, and I'll say fall in love with is a mission. And that mission has to do with payload and it has to do with range. And then we have to create economics, all underpinned with safety, but we have to create economics underpinned by safety when we think about payload, number of passengers, cargo, and when we think about range. And that will lead us 
through you know kind of unbiased you know uh, uh, analysis to a solution uh, with our customers kind of hand in hand you know with our customers. Uh, so I don't have an answer uh, to the specifics of the question on single aisle or twin aisle uh, or the exact uh, part of the market. Some in some parts of this broad market we do quite well. In some parts of the market, you know, Airbus is doing quite well, and that we're not lost. That's not lost in us at all. You mentioned the A321 XLR. Um, so we want to create value for our customers. And the way we create that value is to fall in love with their mission and lead and have engineering trades lead us to the solution. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a changing topics a bit, but coming to an item that you've already mentioned, that's hypersonics. I mean, it's no big secret that the US has fallen behind other nations, some with which we compete uh, pretty vigorously on the development of hypersonic technology, mostly on the military side. But there is a renewed effort, it's pretty clear. There is a renewed effort to catch up on this. And uh, the specific question I wanted to ask you on this is, how much of the development that's needed to catch up on the hypersonics would involve fundamental research of the type that could be potentially conducted in universities or other research organizations, perhaps in collaboration with the manufacturers and sort of the military developers? Yeah, this is a very good question, you know, and, and hypersonics, um, and when we think about the mission, when we think about speeds at over Mach 5, when we think about all of the various building blocks that go into enabling a vehicle like that, there is, this is an area ripe for university partnerships and R&D, and some of the areas here uh, won't, won't surprise you at all. There are things like propulsion system, unstart control, the, the multi-mock inlet and nozzle designs, you know, some of the aerodynamics and physics that go into the boundary layer uh, analysis of and flow control of a vehicle like this that get into its configuration. Guidance, navigation, and control. Oh, uh, at, 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 in operational environments like this, uh, we think about adaptive and robust flight control systems because the plant itself and the environment you're in is changing so dynamically. High performance materials and structures, thermal protection systems that are durable, that again, that, that have to be designed for, for rate and for affordability. Uh, thermal management, you know, I talked about heat exchangers before. Uh, the thing about Mach 5 is that things get hot you know, and, and that heat has to be managed and, and offloaded in a way uh, that has never really been done before. And then finally, and this threads back to some of those model-based discussions that we've had, this, you know, th this is a highly integrated design. And what I mean by that is, and many times engineering is like this, is that if you change something somewhere, something it's something pops up someplace else. Now you might change something in your propulsion system and then you realize you have a flight control problem. You may change a configuration and realize you have a materials problem. Um, so when we think about multidisciplinary design analysis and optimization and think about interconnected multi-physics tools where you can optimize a cost function across multi-disciplines. That isn't just nice to have, it's necessary to create a vehicle like this. You won't get a solution um, in a federated design philosophy. It is highly integrated. Everything depends on everything else. That, that might be Newton's fourth law or something, I don't know, but it, um, it's a highly integrated design, multi-discipline, multi-physics modeling is sort of lying at the heart of it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so we'll switch gears now from Mach 5, we'll go to Mach well below one. And, uh, <laughs> and this is the low, low altitude flying vehicles question. You know, it's no secret. I mean, if you live in the Bay Area or for that matter in Seattle, 
how miserable life has become with uh, commute uh, commute times. And I mean, there's an enormous promise associated with this low altitude flying vehicles, point A to point B, just 50 miles, 20 miles, and so on. And although in a sense, maybe the engineering of these vehicles themselves may not be a major challenge, there seems to be a major challenge of how to make these vehicles in very large numbers coexist safely with commercial airliners and so forth. How do you how do you think this will play out? I mean, is there legitimate hope this will work out? And what are the challenges that need to be addressed? This is a very good question. In fact, it, it ties directly into one of our focus areas, which is our SkyGrid joint venture with, with it's a it's a Boeing and, and Spark Cognition. Spark Cognition is a is a company that we've partnered with, we've we've invested in, uh, and it's a company that builds very state-of-the-art AI uh, systems uh, that are able to, to, to take large data sets and, and then create insights and decisions from them. And, and there's a reason why a company like Boeing would join up with a company like Spark Cognition to create SkyGrid. And it's, it's because now we're going from tens of thousands of things into the air to literally hundreds of there maybe millions of things in the air. And an air traffic control system, an ATM, an air traffic management kind of system will need machines to create the safe, uh, that, that, that will underpin, this, this will not happen, it'll be paced by safety. And so when we think about going from a human in the loop of a system like that to a human, let's say, on the loop. Uh, that's, where, that's where Boeing, a company like Boeing and a company like Spark Cognition synergize uh, to create a technology like SkyGrid. So I think the answer is, is ultimately yes. You know, there is a solution out there. Uh, and we're, we're going after it. You know, we... We are not going to sit back, if you will, and kind of watch here. You know, our ambition is to lead. But we also realize that change is, is required, paced by safety. And uh, algorithms that, that, are, that we're proving and testing with, with uh, very new and different ways for sensing and, and, act, and actors with a human on the loop uh, is what's gonna unlock this capability. Uh, you know, we, we, we can't be scared away of, of millions of objects in the air. We have to find a path to enable it. I appreciate this. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this answer, David. Um, so now we're gonna move back to space. I mean, you mentioned um, space as a significant agenda item for Boeing. And of course there's excitement about space, federal government. Uh, we know that there will be a, another branch of the armed forces, uh, a lot of private in industry investment. It's a major issue with tremendous number of different, different components that need to be attended to. Do you think you can zero into a few of those, maybe one or two of those, especially those that may relate to fundamental research that could be conducted in universities. You know, in some ways, space reminds me a bit like hypersonics. You know, uh, uh, the environments are similar. You think about entry, descent, and landing. Um, the space shuttle is a hypersonic vehicle. Um, getting to actually Mach 10 uh, when you think about that phase of the mission. Uh, so, and that's why space is just such a rich, it, it has moved our country forward, you know, in, in, many, in many different ways. I look at what JPL is doing right now on Mars, and it's just awe-inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of stunned, you know, at, at what they're doing. I'm, I'm just so in awe of, of, of their success. But then you, you sort of break it down. You know, in engineering, what we do is we break a problem down. And 
the problem will break in an aerospace, there's just a host of diversity as you break that problem down to material systems and again, the thermal protection systems around space, environmental control, um, autonomy. You know, in, in many ways, uh, those all those explorations on Mars are, are they're robots. I mean, these are autonomous vehicles, you know, and and they beam down, you know, the the information kind of after the fact. You know, it's it's uh, uh, you get it uh, after after it's all happened, you know, which is which is miraculous, you know. But uh, that's engineering, you know. Um, so there's just a, a, a lot, there's a whole host of diversity of technology within space. And then when you put humans in space, it almost kind of goes 10x, you know, uh, when you think about reliability and safety. And uh, again, internal, the environmental control systems within a vehicle, um, the, the, the various different modes of, of uh, how to keep passenger astronauts safe. Um, so, you know, space has various different dimensions uh, from autonomy to, uh, to a, human, a human piece as well. I ju there's, the list is, is actually huge. And, um, you know, it's, here, here's another, when you think about um, software, um, we, we, our software engineers are, are right there along with our aerodynamicists, right there along with our rocket propulsion specialists. Um, we don't think about our products as just a part count. We think about our products also as the number of lines of code and how we validate and, and get to a trusted uh, piece of sets of software. And it's mission critical, you know? So software engineering, trusted software, um, high reliability software systems and embedded software are, is another area that is absolutely vital to space and to, to really all of aerospace. Thank you very much. I am, um... Uh, paying attention to the time, we're closing into the end, but I, I cannot hold myself from asking the tube and wing airframe question. Since the comet, you know, from the comet to the 787, essentially the airframe of uh, commercial jets has stayed the same. It's, it's a little tube with big tubes, sometimes with wings. There are a lot of thoughts about blended wing bodies and so forth. How, how close to reality are these? Are we going to live long enough to see a blended wing body airplane? You know, um, certainly they're, they're alive and well on the military side, and I, I don't need to tell this audience that. When we think about commercial transport, you know, there's, there's a variety of different things we have to take into account. You know, while there might be an incremental efficiency from such a configuration, you know, where, and you think about, when you think about efficiency, you know, you think about span and, things like wetted area and a blended wing body has advantages. Uh, but when you think about the whole picture, when you think about propulsion airframe integration, when you think about ingress and egress, you know, of passengers, when you think about airport operations, uh, and, and, the, and, and again, to, to go back to an initial uh, point I was trying to make, which is, uh, what we have to fall in love with at Boeing, what we do fall in love with is the mission, not a, config, not, not a particular configuration. Uh, it, will be, it will probably be some time before those kinds of problems can be solved in a realistic way where you can do gate operations, where you can uh, create a comfortable um, uh, ingress and you know, exiting and deplaning kind of process for passing large amounts of passengers. Uh, when you think about, again, long haul kind of travel um, and the size, you know, that might be required uh, from, a, from a BWB. Uh, there's, there is a there there, you know, but I'm not sure, I don't wanna make too big of a bet, but I think the first place you might see a configuration like that 
is probably on kind of short haul, smaller payload kind of missions. Um, and so I, that's kind of where I would, <laughs> I would pay attention to a, a brand new configuration. But, you know, I showed that truss brace wing earlier. And, and while it does kind of, your, if you squint your eyes, it, it you know, looks like a tube and wing. There's a lot of new things there. You know, that's a very different kind of wing. I know it harkens back to aircraft that have trusses and it looks old school, but actually it's very much around new building blocks of laminar flow, high bypass engines. And a lot of, when, when you add up a lot of these building blocks, ultimately it gets to our mission. And that mission is a safe way to add value to, our, to Boeing's customers and to the flying public. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is going to be our last question for uh, for you. Um, and I'll try to fold three different ones that have come from our from our audience. So we have a lot of engineering students in the audience, as you can imagine, and many of them are very eager to know what kind of experiences and qualifications Boeing is looking for in its future engineers. And many of my colleagues and myself are also very keenly interested to know how curricula should evolve in the 2020s, 2030s in order to cater to the needs uh, of the industry. So what will the young Boeing engineer of the late 2020s uh, be like? And how will Boeing be able to compete for this talent actually uh, and get those students in? This is a very, this is perhaps the most central question, you know, and, and while we, we love, you know, the faculty and the capabilities at a place like Berkeley, what we love the most actually are the students, <laughs> you know, if I may, if I may say that, you know, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and, and, and um, what, it's a very important question. And, and there's a few things that come to mind, you know, uh, knowledge of the fundamentals, uh, interdisciplinary experiences, you know, where you think about collisions of knowledge between software and hardware, between electronics and materials, between aerodynamic configurations and thermodynamics, uh, you know, interdisciplinary. And all this speaks to a very integrated sort of model-based future, you know, a digital kind of future. And speaking of that, I think, uh, and I see this already, you know, I've seen it for many years with, with a place like, you know, Berkeley certainly, uh, is that every graduate is a data scientist, you know, is not, they understand uh, what a regression means. And frankly, nowadays, that's the easy stuff. They all know how to use TensorFlow and feed in large categorized sets of data uh, to, to, to um, create classifiers, you know, um, uh, using machine learning and 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 some AI technology, so uh, you know those are the kinds of things that that come to mind. But the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, values. You know, the values that you learn at a place like like Berkeley. You know, collaboration, um, respect for for diverse uh, people, and and. Uh, citizenship and integrity. You know, frankly, we can train almost everything else, but without those things, you know, it's even hard to get started. Thank you thank you so much, uh, Navid, uh, and thank you, Howard, for being with us today. This was a illuminating session on on behalf of the College of Engineering and and the Department of Mechanical Engineering. A big, big gratitude to you for being here. And also great thanks to Boeing for being a staunch supporter of our, our university. We really look forward to continuing our, our collaboration and having you back in one of these webinars in the near future. Thank you also very much to our great audience for its participation and so long everybody. Thank you, thank Carlos. You. Thank you for a rich discussion. And th thank you very much, Naveed. Much appreciated. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Howard. Thank you, Professor. Cheers. So long.